ocean and began to sink. The raft boats were getting ready, everyone was getting on, and there were four priests helping everyone get on the life rafts. There was a Dominican, a Benedictine, a Jesuit, and a Franciscan, go figure. <laughs> and they're all helping everyone get on the boats, and there was only one seat left on the boat. And so the four priests are left on the ship, and there's only one seat on the life raft. So the Dominican says, I've been a good Dominican. I've been faithful to St. Dominic. I've preached well. I've loved Our Lady. Long live the Dominicans as he dives into the water to his death. The Benedictine looks in the water, looks at the boat, sees the empty seat, looks at the other two and says, I've been a good Benedictine. I've prayed well. I've been faithful to my Holy Father, St. Benedict. Long live the Benedictines. And he dives into the ice water to his death. The Franciscan looks in the boat, sees the one seat, looks at the water, the coldness of the water, looks at the Jesuits, and I've been a good friar my whole life. I've been faithful to my seraphic father, Francis, and I shall remain faithful to him long with the Franciscans, and pushes the Jesuit in. <laughs> Probably a true story, once again. <laughs> I was thinking of that joke because I was thinking of our Holy Father, Pope St. Francis, for Pope Francis, not saying yet, Pope Francis. <laughs> it's hard to say Holy Father Francis, meaning the Pope, when we're so used to saying Holy Father St. Francis. But Holy Father Pope Francis recently was in a town in Italy and he was speaking about a tragedy about uh, people who have died on the, in shipwrecks and trying to reach safer shores, trying to get away from persecution. And uh, people have been robbed by doing this and have fallen to their deaths and no one to help them. And Holy Father Pope Francis was reflecting upon this and he pulled two questions from Genesis. Two questions from God, one to Adam, one to Cain. And he used these two questions as the basis of his homily to speak about the responsibility we have for one another. It's speaking about the tragedies and the death and what's taking place and, the, and, and people not helping these people. He said he thought of the question of God to Adam. Adam, where are you? Where are you? Remember when Adam had sinned and he had, he had fallen and he, he went hiding because he discovered he was naked. And so he was in hiding. And the Holy Father reflected on when there are tragedies, why do we hide? Where are we? And then he reflected on the question of our Lord to Cain. After Cain had killed his brother, he said to Cain, Cain, where is your brother? Cain's response, am I my brother's keeper? The answer was, yes, Cain, you are. Where is your brother? His blood cries out to me from the ground. And our Holy Father, Pope Francis, was using these two questions to try to somehow stir our consciences to think about the reality that when people are suffering, where are we? Are we looking around? Are we seeing our brothers anymore? Are we seeing our sisters? He began to reflect upon how we've become so overwhelmed with terrible news and tragedies and so forth, we've become somewhat slothful about it. We've become lukewarm about it, uncaring. And we really don't think about it anymore. And he says, doesn't anybody weep anymore? Have we really wept over the tragedies that have taken place in our world? Do we weep? Or we just go, oh, isn't that terrible? Where are we? Where is our brother? It was an incredible, powerful homily. I read it to the brothers at dinner one night, and I was personally very stirred by, that, by those questions and the way the Holy Father was putting it. In the face of human tragedy, where are we? Who is your brother? Where is your brother? And as only Pope Francis can do, he, he holds a dinner at the Vatican for the homeless and has the cardinals, the cardinals serve them. <laughs> you know? But, but truly, where are we in the needs of others? Do we, have we come to the deep understanding of the fraternal life we have within this world? Or have we become so separated from one another that we no longer care? We're hiding from responsibility. We're hiding from the responsibility to truly care for one another. When we stand before God in judgment and he goes through that list, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. Are we going to be able to say, yes, I was there? Or are we going to hear the opposite? 
When I was hungry, you didn't give me to eat. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me to drink. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Lord, I didn't see you naked, hungry, or thirsty. I was looking for you. And you didn't do it for at least to my brothers. You didn't do it for me. You know, in the separation of the sheep and the goats. One of the kids in my uh, youth group back in New England, he used to say that he wanted to be buried in a T-shirt that said sheep, just so there'd be no question on the day of the resurrection from the dead. <laughs> However, <laughs> that's not going to cut mustard. It won't be the t-shirt that we're wearing that says sheep, or if we're wearing wool. <laughs> I kind of take consolation that Pope, Pope Francis has said that, you know, priests should smell like sheep. <laughs> so I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> Especially when you're wet. <laughs> because he's speaking about the shepherds should be close to their sheep, priests should be close to their people. You know, but, uh, but, but really the question is, are we, are we concerned still? Do we have that care? Do we have that concern? Have we wept? There are so many tragedies in our world we can think of. Abortion, contraception is a tragedy to weep over because what it's leading to in our society. The mass killings, 100,000 Christians being killed a year for their faith. That's a lot of people. Just recently, there was a video online of a priest having his head cut off by a group of Muslims using a kitchen knife. He's already been declared a martyr by the church. Have we wept over these tragedies in our world? Do we weep over the starving, the hungry, and not just those outside far away? But what about the people outside our door or even within our own families? perhaps within our own confraternity, within our own circles? Are we really concerned about one another? Do we recognize our sister as truly our sister? Is the Lord going to say to me, where are you? Where is your sister? Well, Lord, she's at home crying because there's no one to help her right now. Where are you? I'm uh, out having coffee. <laughs> really? The questions are real. Too often times we get wrapped up in our own selves and our own world and we have this indifference going on within our lives, which is just so un-Franciscan of us. It really is. Pope Francis was saying this. He wasn't just saying it about everybody else. He wasn't pointing the finger because he kept reflecting back on himself. Like He was asking these questions of himself too. Like, where am I in the face of tragedy? Where am I? Where's my brother? He was asking himself these questions. Our seraphic father, St. Francis, in founding the order, was very careful as to what name he gave it. And he used two particular words to describe the order or to the naming of the order to which the friars will always remember what the order should be. Friars, minor. Lesser brothers, the least of the brothers. He gave the word brother, the, the, the word brother to the community for a reason. He wanted us always to remember that as religious, we are bound to one another in a brotherhood. Now, Francis would also see it on another level when he talks about Christians, and particularly among the Catholics in our own faith. We are bound to one another. We are more brothers and sisters to one another than we are even to those whom we share blood relations because of the bond we have in Christ Jesus. And so we really need to develop a deep understanding of our universal call to be truly a sister or a brother to everyone we meet, whether they be the richest of people or the poorest of people. And isn't Pope St. Francis leading the way on that? Isn't he showing that by his example? I, love, I don't know what's going on down at World Youth Day. He should be getting there today in Brazil, but it, it must be quite the event knowing him. He's very John Paul-esque in the way he does stuff. <laughs> you know? Now, for the confraternity of penitence, confraternity, with fraternity, in a brotherhood, sisterhood, in a fraternity, in a family, you're not just part of some group like the Knights of Columbus although the Knights of Columbus use the term Brother Knights. You're not just in some other group like the, um, 
you know, the altar society. It's not just some other group. This is something you have been formed to. Some of you have already pledged. Some of you are novices in preparing for that pledge. You're coming into a family. And that family must be solidly formed together. It must be strong together. And you need to form together. Uh, Andy can probably speak better to this than I can, the fact that his father was a mason. <laughs> and he built things with lots of big stones. But whenever we build things with stone, it must be a firm structure. It's got to be firm, or it's going to collapse. When we build with stone, it must be firm, and, or else it will collapse. Each stone has to be finely hewn, or the structure will lean and eventually fall. Each stone must be carefully cut, or it falls. It must be cemented together, or there'll be cracks, leaks, and the structure will be ruined. It must rest upon one upon the other, or else it'll just tumble down. The beauty of each stone makes the structure beautiful. When you look at you know, the old style buildings, I tend to like the old style cut stone as opposed to the cinder block, you know, buildings. I think we all do, right? Because each stone is so unique, and when you see the whole structure put together, each stone makes the rest of the building beautiful, each resting upon the other. And each stone has its place, and is particularly placed in that place. This is so much the case with fraternity, especially with the confraternity, with your own formation as a community. You together must be a firm structure, united, an understanding of the gift of the charism that God has given to you. The charism is the gift of the Holy Spirit to live the gospel in a particular way. You've been given the gift of the charism of the confraternity of penitence, which is a gift to live the gospel in a particular way. And each one of you must be finely hewn. Has God been doing hard work on you? Has he been hewning you like a stone? Has he been chipping you away? Have you felt the blows of his hammer? <laughs> Have you felt the hard cutting going on? <laughs> it hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Has he been rounding out those edges and softening it? Ooh, Lord, I didn't want you to make, take that away. You know? Ow, you had a hit there? You know? <laughs> because the Lord has to form each of you. The constitutions will do that to you. The rule will do that to you. The lessons will do that to you. And through the gift of the charism, through the gift of the confraternity, you will each be finely hewn. And if you're not the structure is going to get leaks and eventually fall. Each stone has to be carefully hewn. Being cemented together, you have to really bond with one another, be able to learn how to lean on one another, that each stone resting upon the other. You need to learn to rest upon one another. What I have witnessed here in the past three days has been beautiful. Well, two days. How long have we been? It feels like three days. It's only been two days. Oh, so three, actually. Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, we're, we're three, three. We're good. We're three. Okay. It's been beautiful. What I've noticed as each of you arrived, especially those of you who've known each other for quite some time, is a true love for one another and a very much of a welcoming of the new people who have come in. It's evident. And that's good. There's been a lot of laughter in the hallways. You're not supposed to be talking. <laughs> However, they say if you pass a Benedictine monastery, you'll hear the chanting of Gregorian chant. If you pass a Dominican priory, you'll hear the reading of Thomas. If you pass a Franciscan friary, you'll hear laughter. <laughs> so that's a good sign the charism's alive and well. <laughs> but it's been evidence that you truly do love one another. You truly care for one another. And some of you live very far away from each other. But this needs to continue. That, you know relationship takes work. Relationships are not easy. It takes hard work. And each person individually makes the structure beautiful. 
each individual. No one's asked to stay.